We've heard about how powerful the mind can be, but what happens when it leads you to jail for a crime you didn't commit? This is the story of the Beatrice Six. It was a cold February morning in a small farming town in Nebraska when Helen Wilson's sister found her dead on the floor, with an afghan tied tightly around her face and her hands bound. Helen Wilson was 68 at the time, a mother and a grandmother to many. The entire Beatrice community was shocked. A murder in this small community was unexpected. It's one of those towns that everybody's got a friendly hand. Beatrice is basically the only place I've ever really known or wanted to live. The crime scene was hard to take in for this innocent poor lady. She was still wearing her blue nightgown and there was blood all over the mattress, on the wall, and even in her underwear. Someone had brutalized this old woman and the only clue that the police had so far was the blood all over the scene, which turned out was not all hers. But whose was it? Some people had already made up their mind who had done it and why they had done it. If people had knowledge, I mean, they asked for it. If you know what went on, if you know something, if you suspect something, please come talk to us. Don't just blab it out. Come talk to us. Let us work with it. It was clear that there was some struggle. This seemingly defensive little old lady fought back and made her attacker leave behind DNA. Let's take a look at how an open shut case became a far more troubling mystery. At around 9.30 a.m. on February 5th, Helen's sister was off to visit Helen. On getting into the house, she met the shock of her life. The lifeless body of Helen that had been stabbed severely, but worst of all, she was suffocated to death. There was numerous cuts on the hand and on the top of the hand, probably defensive cuts from something like a sharp object, like a knife. There was still a significant amount of cash in the apartment indicating that this was not a robbery and that whoever did this was not interested in taking Helen's money. Perhaps at the time, this was the only clarity in the case. On arrival, the police took her body to the coroners for an autopsy to see if they could get any more leads. They discovered something very troubling. The 68-year-old woman had been raped. The police collected that DNA left in her body. Notified by the hospital that they had found very active semen in both the vagina and the rectum. During an initial survey of the crime scene, investigators discovered even more blood on her bedding and some on her clothing. Police also found three fingerprints in her house, one on a knife and two on a door frame. The investigation was opened immediately by the Beatrice Police Department, but with all the evidence leading to no one, no arrests were made. So how did this case eventually lead to the conviction of six different people for the murder and rape of Helen Wilson? There was no shortage of evidence, but the police could not narrow down a list of suspects. It wasn't until a retired Bert Searcy, who was once a Beatrice PD officer, looking into the case that there was some progress. Bert found a local resident that claimed to know something about the perpetrator. 17-year-old Lisa Odendorf, who was a local resident at the time, claimed to have seen three people, Joseph White, Tom Winslow, and Joanne Taylor, pull into Helen's driveway on the night of the murder. In addition, she claimed that on the following day, Joanne Taylor confessed to her that she and Joseph White had killed Helen. As Searcy was not an active officer at the time, this could not be considered an official part of the investigation. Of course, at that time, I wasn't on the police department, nor was I a law officer. I was just doing my general work around my farmstead. However, when Searcy joined the sheriff's department, he decided to enlighten the others on what Lisa had told him about the murders. White, Winslow, and Taylor were brought in for questioning. During the series of questioning, Taylor admitted to participating in the crime and even brought up another accomplice, Cliff Sheldon. The police arrived at Cliff Sheldon's house to question him, and he accused his wife, Deborah, of being present when the crime was committed. When Deborah was pressed by investigators, she admitted to being there, along with another man, James Dean. So after all the finger pointing and open confessions, it wasn't long before all five of them were behind bars for the death and rape of Helen Wilson. What about the sixth person? Kathy Gonzalez, a woman who lived directly above Helen, was eventually questioned and later became involved and arrested. How and why did six people openly confess to committing the murder of a 68-year-old woman? There was no clear motive, and since each person openly confessed to the crime, you would expect they would explain to the police how and why they did this. However, it turns out that the only reason they were convicted was due to their confessions despite all the evidence left at the scene. There was no sufficient evidence to actually link any of them to the crime. Why would anyone confess to a crime and not remember how or why they did it? Another problem that led to the convictions was because of how Gage County attorney Richard Smith had used his influence to get some of them to flip on each other and confess to the crime by offering them plea deals. Convincing them it was their only option. 
The six were all sentenced to different lengths of time in prison. All of them had confessed to the crime except White. Since White continued to deny his involvement but was given a life sentence, while Wilson received 50 years, Taylor got 40 years, and the other three suspects were sentenced to 10 years. However, things take a turn when White applied for an appeal. Helen Wilson's family had some relief and closure after these six were behind bars. They had now gotten justice, and dangerous people were taken off the streets. Until Doug Stratton, an appeal attorney, found out about this case and definitely took an interest. Stratton noticed that despite having all the DNA evidence, there was no DNA analysis done that directly linked the six to the murders. He filed a suit, asking to have a full forensics analysis of all physical evidence related to the crime. The results came back as a shock. None of the six could be placed at the crime scene around the time of the murder. So why did they confess, and who was actually responsible? With the help of Special Investigator Tina Bath, the police found a match for the DNA samples collected at the scene. One man was identified as having a direct link to the crime. His name was Bruce Allen Smith. This man was on the radar but had been eliminated as a suspect because his blood did not match the blood that was found at the crime scene. Everyone was stunned by this new development. But if Bruce Allen Smith was the perpetrator and the only DNA match, what was the role of the other six? How did five people come to confess to a crime they were never involved in? Why were they not set free like Bruce Allen Smith was? Only one of them had matching blood type at the scene. The investigation was found to have been very mishandled with many issues. One of them is the manner in which the suspects were interviewed. During Winslow's interview, there was a 44-minute period in which the recording was switched off. When it was resumed again, Wilson was admitting to having taken part in the crime. How does someone go from blatantly denying something to openly admitting it? What happened in those 44 minutes and why did the police want to hide it? There were also similar occurrences with the other five suspects. Most of the other interrogations ended up in a similar way. Something happened to make them change their statements during the interviews. According to later interviews with the Beatrice Six, as they were now called, it was discovered that the psychologist was convincing them that they had committed the crimes but were repressing the memories due to their mind trying to forget the horrible things they did. He would then piece together his own story to help them remember what happened that night. The name of the psychologist was Dr. Wayne Price, and he was brainwashing them into believing they had committed the murder. Despite varying accounts of the crime by the suspects and no concrete evidence linking them to the crime, they were sentenced to time in prison. Hypnosis has been used on a possible witness. Dr. Price, is a local psychologist, is conducting the hypnosis sessions. Although an argument could easily be made for the police due to the lack of DNA testing in the 1980s, the original court decision was reversed in 2009 after several attempts by Joseph White's attorney. Ultimately, the Beatrice Six were set free and awarded $28 million in compensation for being brainwashed into confession and losing years of their life for nothing.